you're listening to the Fusion Patrol Podcast. Hello. Welcome to another episode of Fusion Patrol. I'm Eugene. And I'm Ben. And tonight, once again, we are Star Lost. This time, we're making our way through the Gallery of Fear. Insert scary music. Uh, so we've got uh, we've been a, we've been away from the Star Lost for a while. I know how disappointed everyone is. We don't have David here tonight. Um, I I couldn't rope him in for another session of beating up on the Star Lost, which I, I feel like I've I feel like I've failed to uh, inflict this pain on him. I guess I'll have to live with it. Um, he seems to like it. <laughs> So, Gallery of Fear are three heroes who have reverted back to their old clothes. If you may recall from our last story, we were commenting on the fact that they had new clothes. Um, yeah, it's kind of a, a very spacey, mylar material. <clears throat> yeah, now they're back to their folksy Cypress Corners uh, clothing. Uh, are walking down, very purposely down a hallway, and... This big wind with leaves and dirt and stuff comes in and blows them into it. They have to get into it. It was doorway. like an Arizona monsoon. <laughs> or nonsoon, as the case well, may a be. A boob. <laughs> and they're, they're funneled into this art gallery, and they all stand around looking at these strange bits of art. And um, for starters... <laughs> I'm not going to go through this story at that level. That's just crazy. They just meet up with this woman who's like running this gallery and it's doing stuff to their minds. And then there's like Magnus. 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 <laughs> Who she keeps talking about, who's like the greatest brain in the galaxy. And uh, so then Devin's all belligerently Devinish and the others are all kind of like. Those are kind of dumb. And then. Magnus turns out to be a self-aware computer, and it's trying to trick Devin into uh, erasing its prime directive. Wink, wink, say no more, say no more, and uh, then they kill it. So Yeah, basically he wants to get rid of his uh, safeguard so that he can be more... Do um, something. Not necessarily self-aware, but um, be able to have uh, more free will. Control the universe. Not have any inhibitions on him. Um, this episode is... Really, I, I would have said, um, we, have, we have taunted you, dear listener. We have taunted you time and time again by saying that at some point we are going to review The Imp, which is, without doubt, the worst episode of Man from Atlantis. And it, it was I have television's been, darkest and hour, I, in And my I opinion. have been saying that it is the worst bit of television I've ever seen. But having seen this episode twice now, I'm not entirely sure that this isn't worse. You're and, kidding. I didn't hate it that badly. I mean, I thought it was kind of just dumb. But, I, I mean, I, I'm sorry. I Naked Montague da- just puts me into a rage David did not. This. David is not here to join us tonight, but he did watch this episode with me yesterday. And, uh, and he had a very good comment about the show at the end, which I'm going to pass on. But full credit to David. That was that 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 episode of Star Lost would have been very would have looked like an excellent job if it had been done on public access. <laughs> now, I th- and that's what actually why I separate the difference between it and the Imp. The Imp may be the may be network television's darkest hour, but at least it was professionally done. This looks so. It does look amateurish. Very, it, it, it does. It's unbelievable. And it's such a strange script, too. It's written by a couple of unknown people, and we'll, we'll talk about that. Well, I, they're unknown to me, and they... I have no idea who they are. There's no dialogue for nearly the first five minutes. I timed it. Four minutes, 37 seconds before the first line of dialogue in this no, episode. No, a lot of it is, I am trying to walk against the wind. I'm looking at a piece of art. I'm staring vacuously. I am... I am staring s- drug stoned vacuously at things. Um, now I'm staring into the air. 
And they're so bad. There are times when they're supposed to be giving each other, instead of dialogue, they're supposed to be communicating with looks. And like, they look at each other, and they're so bad that it's really difficult to try to figure out what it is they're supposed to be saying to each other. But frankly, uh, I think it's a bold and daring exercise in script writing, but it's so totally wrong. There is no way that three people would have been blown into this gallery and not said anything while they were being blown into the gallery. You know, like, where'd the wind come from? Ah, we've got to get out of the way. Nothing like that. They go into the gallery. Nobody says, what is this place? Or, or nothing. No, they're just, it's, it's inconceivable that they would not, that three humans would not communicate to each other. Right. I'm sure it was meant to be, you know, we're, we're doing something artsy here, but it was just, and, and they're just so bad. And then there's the dialogue. Yeah. What, what dialogue it is there? When they say things, they're it's stilted. It's it's. Well, there's there's a, a scene, it, and I actually had to stop because it made me laugh. Where our our intrepid band is, you know, they're in this gallery. Uh, Garth is staring at some structure which has promptly disappeared, but then. He has this blank, vacuous face as he keeps staring at it. And Devin just goes up to him and says, you're, Garth, you're, you're acting, acting as though you were hypnotized. hypnotized. Yes. And I thought, well, what a great line for all the wrong reasons. Yes, it's, it's a great line for all the reasons. And our pity our viewers, our listeners can't see it, but I'm, gonna, I'm just pointing this out on the camera for Ben. There is my quote of that line. I have it too. <clears throat> yeah. I've got it on my iPad it, also. It's so bad. That I wrote it down. Yeah. And there's others. They're just so... Oh, there's a lot of bad, bad lines in this episode. So this girl appears, and she's, she's quite beautiful. And because she's quite beautiful, Garth says something like, I've never seen anyone like you. You. <laughs> well, I guess if you hung around Rachel all the time. <clears throat> it was a bit of a plain Jane. Um, you might... You might be shocked, although he's run across several beautiful girls before uh, in the arc. He usually is the guy who falls in love with them. Yeah, but this is the first space babe that he's ever met. I, I guess. So the one who was trying to sow discord and... Uh, a she two was too young. Ago. Yeah. She was too young. That was they the come from Cypress Corners. I'm betting 14. They're, they're a churn in the butter and... You know, yeah, that's probably right. That, yeah. That, I wouldn't be surprised with that. So, of course, to meet this woman who is actually closer to Garth's age and is something of a blonde bombshell. I mean, she's, okay, she's yeah. Attractive. I mean, he, she, she is a kind of woman that Garth has never met before. Um, we're explaining to this gallery, the, the art changes to your mind because it uses psychosymmetric reading devices and reads your mind, mental state, and it makes the art. So you're actually kind of altering the art. You're making the art as you are there. But every time Garth and Rachel look at it, they just seem to get into this sort of euphoric, hypnotic, uh, drooling state. And they're not very good at making this acting-wise. They, they really do just appear drugged. Um, maybe they're supposed to appear drugged, but they, they're... The problem is that I can't really tell the difference between their drug state and their uh, lucid Sometimes it's, it's... I just can't tell. Yeah. Especially with Rachel. Uh, and what about... She always has that, that, yeah, that blind, terrible. vacuous look. That, that she's terrible. What about, what about the scene where uh, they're, they're hypnotized and Devin decides he's got to wake up Garth, so he slaps him. Slaps the piss out of him. He just gives him one good slap, and what does Garth do? He immediately snaps, too, and he shouts, I'll kill you! I hate you! No, I'll he says, you. I'll kill you. I'll kill you, yeah. And then Devin knees him in the nuts. Um, sorry, I had to do that. I'm sorry, I had to do that. I, and, but he's okay now. He, but you can't tell he's back to normal because he's still acting badly. So it's like, is he normal or is he still hypnotized? I, I'm not sure. Well, I kind of got the feeling that, yeah, he was slapped, sna slapped back to normal. <laughs> but uh, 
The dialogue indicates he's slapped back to normal, yeah, but his yeah, acting his, doesn't. His, yeah, his acting doesn't. Uh, and that that's another thing that bothered me, because he would continually fall into these, these trance-like states, and after having these periods of of lucidity with Devin, where he's very clear-minded and in control of his faculties as they are, you'd think that he'd be a bit wiser to the tricks that Magnus likes Magnus. to pull up. At. But no, he he buys uh, Magnus's uh, little gimmicks uh, every single time. Yes, pretty much his parents show up, his dad's his, like, his father shows up. <laughs> And it's, then he sees Devin as a monster. Oh, it's the yeah, the Devin as a monster one is really funny. I mean, what, what kind of monster was that? The Wicker Man? He's like, you know, I don't know. It's, it's it's like uh, it, it was. It's like newspapers a, hanging off of his clothes, he, and his he face felt a is going to warp. Gesturish. Yeah, it was. Well, that was. It was. It was so stupid, and and that he just. Oh, I have to save you, and then I have to save you, Rachel, and then he tries to Attack choke Devin. Devin, Devin yeah, oh, was oh, obviously saying it. it, it, it so anyway, Devin, in this episode, Devin is in his full-on, I don't trust you, I'm belligerent, I'm... He's superhero pushing. Devin. He's superhero Devin. He's, he's out trying to, you know, immediately they take him to rooms. It's like, oh, three rooms. It's like you were expecting three people. And they know their names. And they, and he, so he goes off and finds a computer. A sphere, sphere projector. A sphere projector. And he's asking it questions. And it's, you know, it's giving its usual, you know... Can I Can give I be a assistance? assistance? You are in Dome Alpha Omega Beta Thetacron 4. And then it says, well, tell me about uh, who is Magnus. Who is Magnus? Magnus, Magnus is, is blah, the- blah, <laughs> blah, <laughs> blah, blah, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. And then Can I be of assistance? assistance? Yeah, the, the screen fades to black, and then it comes back, and we go through this little game several times. But he's... But the guy, he's actually saying, blah, blah, blah. Uh, well, he says, uh, the, the actual quote is, Magnus is, is the... Blah, 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 blah. Yeah, he's, he's making a little blah, blah, because they're fading the sound down in the picture. And I think the actor was just kind of you know, doing some mumbly noises intentionally. Well, the thing to that bothers it. me is, finally, uh, Devin uh, uses some logic to trap... Uh, the personality in the sphere projector saying, you were able to answer the question about where I am. You can answer the question about Magnus. And the projector uh, tells him that um, the information on Magnus can only be triggered by the ARC commander's code. Well, I'm thinking, well, why the heck didn't you just say that the first time? I See, I got the impression Magnus was shutting him down. Oh, you know, that's a good thought, but... But then why uh, didn't Magnus shut him down on... Yeah, it, did, it doesn't no, quite... No, it, 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 well, it doesn't make any sense, because we then begin to realize... I mean, well, we kind of know already from the synopsis that it's about this computer that kind of wants its own free will. So, okay, so now here we have this extremely large arc that has a computer system that is, well, not fully networked. I mean, it's it's several different computer systems, and... They can operate independently from one another. Yeah, and so and yet the main computer that everybody goes to, where the sphere projectors are, I mean, obviously it has its own prime directive of sorts, or its own safeguards, and that is, it can only be triggered by the Arc Commander's code. Well, if that's part of your programming, I mean, and the sphere projector is nowhere near as sophisticated as Magnus, Magnus. is, so. <laughs> Why not just say that the first time? Why? Because it's not as funny. It's it's funny, but then it turns out that the two computers, um, the the sphere projectors, uh, which are the arc systems, and Magnus get into a they get into a an fight. argument. <laughs> it's the most boring fight. Ever. It <laughs> is so stupid. <laughs> and, but it makes for great uh, comedy, um, especially but, when Rachel states the obvious. They're having an argument. argument. <laughs> it's like, thank you, Rachel. There are there are you and Garth and Devin and and an imaginary woman and two computers. And I guarantee you, you are the dimmest thing in this room. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> um. <laughs> so we we get from the sphere projector in their fight, really, basically. Something about you know Magnus had to be 
turned off, basically, or isolated. And that ought to be enough to stop Devin because he's he's in full on, you know, I'm not doing anything till you give me adequate explanations mode. Right. And then so the the computer has to have something reprogrammed by a person and it's giving and Devin kind of agrees to do it sort of. He wants to talk to the admiral of the ship, Admiral Austin. And Magnus can do that because Magnus has stored uh computer records and information about these people and so Magnus can actually bring back the admiral in form. Make and a so, hollow version of them. It's very similar to what like the holodeck could do in next gen. So so they he starts off with, you know, here I'll start and do the instructions. Uh so what you do is you go to the console there and you um you start typing in delete prime directive four seven five 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 one nine three seven eight. And Garth is like, delete Prime Directive 4 4. No, I think Hang I'm. Hang on a minute. <laughs> I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna comply. Why you? you? So now I want the Admiral. I'm halfway through it. Give me the Admiral. And so the computer finally gives him the Admiral. And the Admiral pops up, and of course the Admiral does what he would expect. It's like, uh, you're not authorized. Get out of here. I'm, I'm the officer. You're not personnel. You shouldn't be here. Wait a minute, I'm in the Magnus control room. Why am I in the Ma- And Devin's like, no, no, the ship's, you know, in danger and you're dead. I you're really just a this. you're just a computer projection that Magnus has created. And and he goes, Well, in that case, I can't help you because I'm just a collection of recorded images and bits of speeches and orders and commands I've given, and I'm I'm not capable of independent thought or to help and you in any my, way. It's like, and it's like, but has, you're making independent thought exactly. right there. I mean, if that, if, if if you're just nothing but a collection of all these different things, then I expect to be hearing just a an endless sound bites. torrent of exactly of sound bites. That's Unless, all of I course, be getting. he once recorded a speech where he said, "Well, then I can't help you because I'm just an." Oh, would of, that be convenient? I guess everyone's required to do that in case they they in case they get back. recreated by Magnus. Yeah. <laughs> But he does get far enough along to say that Magnus um, cannot be trusted. Can't be trusted. We had to, he malfunctioned right away, and we had to turn him off. And so Devin ultimately decides not to finish the thing. And they're gonna they're trying to, you know, make Garth kill Devin and do all sorts of stuff. And they have another great line in this one, where Devin says something to the effect that we're gonna have to instead of deleting the prime directive we're going to have to delete we're going to have to wipe his memory and they all run over to the console and i think it's rachel that says it there must be a switch or a lever i <laughs> it might have been garth I, actually, I think it was garth it's one of them it's like yep the old and then switch rachel was like the old wipe but, memory switch or lever on computer but but yeah i thought sure okay yeah <laughs> there, yeah there, every major computer has got that that big failsafe, so you know, power off. Yeah, arm. the one arm bandit. Exactly. They all have it. It's it's standard equipment. No, Rachel is there to say, well, isn't this like killing? Wouldn't we be killing Magnus, Magnus if we did this? Yeah. Well, he's a computer. You can't make a deal with a computer. He's a liar. We'll just shut him off. They kill him. So there you go. It's a tense, and then it's a tense moment. Of course, their clothing goes back to normal too. So they had apparently yeah. changed in their minds. They're in, the, but they're in um, hollow clothing. So, okay, their um, did that mean were, were they, they were naked? actually naked? Apparently not. They just thought they'd change their clothes, wow. which really doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Why they would? Why need? Why Magnus why would, would you do need that? To, yeah, exactly. So now, that, I, I think that they were actually probably naked, but you can't obviously couldn't show that on television. Except, of course, when it went back, they they had their clothes on. So um, when it when the illusion faded, um, they had a tense moment trying to get through a door. And that was kind of rough there for some reason, like they were in a hurry or something with a dead computer. And and then when they get out into the corridor, <laughs> this was good. This was good. The little glowy thing shows up in the hallway. And there's yet another computer. There's a whole network of computers, like the tent- interlocked, like the tentacles of an octopus. And it, you, we, we have you stored have, in our memory banks. We are the nascent mandibles of the universal mind. 
which is a great line. And then it says, Beside, your, your names have been noted down. Beside your name, the crime of rendering Magnus inoperative. We'll remember you. That kind of stuff. And so the story ends with them now being wanted to be killed by the ship's computers. Which I thought was just ridiculous because if Magnus was the, if, if he was the best of the bunch. And he had a prime directive. Then all these other self-aware ones have prime directives. I mean, obviously, they, they must all have prime directives. I mean, it's, it's got to be all part of their system. And if he was the best one of all of them, if he was the smartest one of all of them, and if he could not have killed or done anything, I mean, permanent, uh, permanently damage our three, P, our three heroes, or specifically Devin, then I would think that any threat from any other computer on that ship would be laughable. Well, there is one thing that was a little disturbing. So let's say that Magnus, Magnus, sorry, has this prime directive, and it's a prime directive like we know from Asimov's robot. Yeah, rules. It's, yeah, exactly. I don't know whether it is or not. But it's basically, not, but the important one is that you cannot do something to harm somebody, or you cannot, through inaction, Co- bring harm. Bring harm or cause to somebody. Harm. Yeah. So, them creating the illusion that Devin was a monster and having Garth attack to kill him would be a violation, a violation of the Prime Directive. So, therefore, you know, these other computers, if they have that similar restriction, they could cause them to. St- you know, push the wrong button and open it into space, or but they're not like as that. clever. They not as clever, but the, you know how clever do you have to be to fool somebody with a switch? I don't know. But in other words, they the, the potential is there that they could harm them. It, I suppose so, but again, I come back to if Magnus was the smartest. Excuse me, if Magnus is the smartest, that's going to be the joke of the year now. It, the, <laughs> We're going to be coming back to this one for we a do, while. We, have, yeah, we, we, we make, have a new meme. We, we make fun of this one because at times they just called it Magnus, but then at other times the girl... The, the, the girl, she... First she, was, would, Magnus. she would oddly say it that way. She would like, Magnus. I have it written down that way. Three capitals. I do M-A-G too. and then small N-U-S. Magnus. Yeah. And it, it's so weird when she says it that way. Uh, I think but it's think supposed to be referential. Off as, it, no, it just came off as comical. I know, but I think that's what she was going for, was like, the great Magnus, Magnus. and it just yeah. doesn't come off. No, it doesn't work. So, if Magnus could not eliminate or control permanently uh, our three three people, well, he could with Garth and Rachel, had Devin not been there, I'm sure he would have succeeded with Garth and Rachel, but uh, as far as Devin is concerned, he was completely ineffective. Pretty much, yeah. And even even Devin was able to uh, help snap out uh, any any trances that Garth or Rachel might have been under. I, you know, when Rachel was under her spell, I was really expecting him to just grab her by the shoulders and then give her a good whack across the face like he did with Garth. I know, but he just shook her and then she was like, "I hate you." You brute! Yeah. <laughs> exactly. It was, it was, it was dreadfully awful. This is a dreadfully awful show. This this episode had the worst acting of any episode of Star Lost we've seen. It had the probably the most stilted dialogue. It it had uh, really poor special effects. Some of them quite psychedelic. Um, it it was just a stupid. Stupid, stupid, stupid. <laughs> story. It it really is bad, and it looks amateurish. And um, and there's there's one scene earlier in the show uh, where it's where the room that they go into is an art gallery, and this is this, I, this part really freaked me out. So, so it's kind of there's a room that you're that's obviously the forum. And it's got, like, red carpet. And then there's a room behind it that's kind of got green carpet. And it's kind of an angular room. And it's sort of an extension of the gallery. And in the beginning of the show, they never step into the green room. 
they are walking, they get very close to it, to the edge of it, but they will never step into the green room. And it moves, because it's obviously a CG, or not CG. It's a key insert. It's a key insert. Obviously, it's a key insert, and it's like, it's so obviously a key insert that you watch it and you go, well, you know, okay, this show has that problem. But Chief then later in the episode, when the gallery is gone and they're escaping, they actually run through that green carpet onto the red carpet to get out. I'm like, wait, how, how did they do that? <laughs> So it's either, it, it's a real set that looks so bad that it looks like a key insert, or they had one with the key insert and one and then without one, that the... And one an actual physical set. And that just doesn't make any sense. So I don't, I don't and I'm not going to well, go back a third time to try to make no, sense and, out of it. And then, well, trying to make, yeah, trying to make any sense out of these, uh, out of the production values and, and the stories uh, is, is a lost cause. Yeah, it, it's a lost cause. So I want to talk about a lost cause here. So I think that's pretty much uh, avoid this episode like the plague unless you just want to see the most boring computer fight of all time. Well, but th there are elements in this that are just downright funny. They're unintentional, but they're funny. I mean, the, the argument between the sphere projector and Magnus is, is a bit of a hoot. Did you, by the way, by, did you by any chance have any difficulty understanding what Magnus was actually trying to say? Not really, no. Because he kept spouting stuff, and I mean, I have a reasonably competent uh, command of uh, the, your, uh, the, you know, the way with words thing. The and English language? <laughs> yeah, that thing. And uh, he was speaking... And he was speaking words that I understood. Yeah, speaking in tongues or something? I don't know. And he was speaking, you know, in a voice that was comprehensible, but the dialogue was just so obtuse about <laughs> rationization and uh, yeah. index file for seven well, nation okay. and nation subject Devon argument part. Five sex and you know it's just he's just yeah it's it like, was it was what? it was completely ridiculous. I think that was yeah. When you asked if I understood, I thought you meant it, could I physically hear <clears throat> what was being said, and the and the answer to that was yes. Half the Did time, I, anything that he said makes sense. No, you only got about four or five words out of the whole stream. It was enough to tell you what he was trying to get them to do or say, but it was like well, I'm having was, to gloss over it because most of it's. Gibberish. It's gibberish. Well, I think here again, we're talking about an era where no one really had any concept of what AI was going to be like. You're dealing with writers that were probably had just graduated from uh, junior high, and they are trying their darndest to create an episode with this super computer. Canadian junior high. Canadian junior high. Oh, uh, okay. Ladies, yes, uh, to all our Canadian fans, send your hate mail to Eugene Glover. A anyway. I, we have some more to talk about that, actually. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, anyway, I, I think what happened is you've got these writers that are trying to create uh, a character in Magnus. And the best way to make him come across as this incredible, incredibly intelligent, smartest mind in the universe computer is to make him sound like some sort of pretentious git. Yeah, maybe that's... that's. And that so you, you just write this nonsense. Uh, I mean, Star Trek Technobabble makes more sense than yes. what this did. Yes, it does. So, um, in my... In Not my so quest, humble opinion. <laughs> in my quest to understand the Star Lost, I think we talked about the fact that I have the the, the graphic novel of well, the multi-part graphic novel Phoenix Without Ashes, which is Harlan Ellison's original script, uh, now has been recently redone in, in graphic novel form. And when I say graphic novel, I, of course, mean comic book. Comic book. But it sounds far more pretentious and not like I'm a seven-year-old if I call it a graphic novel. It's not so nerdy. <laughs> and I don't know if graphic novel is less nerdy, but... nerdy, but It's a funnies book. And... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> uh which, frankly, I didn't think was that much different from the pilot. 
Uh, it had a few variations here I, and there, but hope, not much. I hope Harlan is not uh, not listening, because I'm, I'm sure he's a regular listener of the podcast. And um, and he's banging his fist against the desk as he listens to us. But I also just uh, completed reading. Um, well, we'll start with <clears throat> a website, which I can I'll put a link to in the in the show notes. <laughs> <laughs> or up on the forums, I'm not wait, sure which one of one or both, um, which is like a, a fan page for the Star Lost, and uh, amongst the stuff on the fan page is uh, <clears throat> some of Harlan Ellison's original writer's Bible for the Star Lost, and it is a fascinating read. It is uh, you you read that, well I read that, and I'm like I want to see this show. This is this. What a cool idea. I mean, the, the premise is the same. Obviously just the same. But <clears throat> he goes on talking about the type of story, the type of character they want Devin to be, the type of character they want um, Drip to be. Um, and, you know, Devin is not supposed to be the hero triumphant or the hero eternally triumphant, as he calls them, which is Captain Kirk, or the, the hero of a standard show who's always winning. He's supposed to be flawed and, you know, do irrational things at times. and Which would make sense, given uh, where the character comes from. And Rachel, he calls the most fascinating character in the show because she has been raised to be chattel, to be nothing but a, the, a plaything for her man, in Cypress Corners because that's what women are in that community and and so her journey is further than anyone else on the show because during the course of the show which he puts as you know six to nine years um, well there's, there's no modesty on Mr. Ellison's part um, where she grows to think for herself and have a sense of humor for herself and and I think if that's what they're trying to go for in the stories we see, they failed miserably because she just comes off as a cipher. But, again, um, the character of Garth is actually supposed to be hunting them all the time. And he's uh, sometimes has to come into an e uneasy alliance with them for his save his own life. And at other times, he's on his own, or he's chasing them. And so, it, in a way, it, it's sort of like the fugitive, or probably yeah, or probably more appropriately like Logan's Run, about uh, the TV series. But yes, yeah, sort of like the fugitive. Um, and there is a, there is, and I kid you not, it's there from the 1973 writing. This was supposed to have a story arc from beginning to many years on the arc involved the story arc involved the disaster he describes the background of earth earth is burned up it's used out it's polluted and there's going to be some catastrophe coming some we don't know what it is we'll find out in the ninth year but it doesn't matter solar flares meteors drawing our atmosphere off it's unknown but it's going to be something that is going to absolutely destroy all life on Earth. Earth has, people have moved to Mars and Venus, but they're hard living planets, not many people there, and the catastrophe that's going to destroy the Earth is going to destroy them too. And so the Earth breaks down into the groups of people who are you know, fatalistic and, and living for the day and society collapsing, and the philanthropists and the thinkers and the great people who set up to build the Ark. And they build the Ark and they send it out into deep space. They have sent 20 other ships into deep space in the past. None has ever returned. Mm. And the reason for that will become clear. Because mm -hmm. the reason they never returned is the same thing that happened to the Ark. Interesting. And he goes on to talk something about black holes and stuff galactic sized black holes and stuff which doesn't make any sense but he you know he kind of says well it doesn't really you know it doesn't really matter but there's there's something there that we're going to find out that's relevant later on 
to do with any of man's colonization of space. And, so. and then, then there's a section written by Ben Bova, who is, was the scientific consultant uh, for this show. Uh, and I will say right now, you see Ben Bova's name on every episode, scientific consultant. Ben Bova's own words. I couldn't get out of that contract. I dutifully did my job. They sent me the scripts. I pointed out the scientific problems. I wrote up things to suggest to change them so that they would work correctly. I sent them back. I was paid handsomely. They completely ignored everything I sent them. Yeah, it shows. But his name's on there, and so you look at this and you think, really, Ben Bova? You know, came up with that stupid idea for a computer or something. No, like that. he didn't. And he didn't. That's right. He he's he's blameless in that. Um, there's a section where he talks about the technology used on the Ark, the types of spacesuits that they would have, the propulsion systems, the artificial gravity systems. It's all thought out on these ships, and the the heat exchangers along the tubes. It's you, you look at that and you go. How did it go so badly wrong? And uh, so that's fi interesting. If anybody's interested, I would go take a look at that page and read some of the read some of the stuff that's available online. And then another thing is Ben Bova, after his getting shafted on this thing, wrote a novella called The Star Crossed, which I now have a copy of in a finished reading. And he, in the introduction, kind of implies that what you're reading in this story is what really happened. However, I, I can't believe that, because some of it is just so obviously fictionalizedly crazy that you, you just can't look at it and go, no, I, I really don't think the network executives bet half the budget on the Super Bowl. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> maybe they did. but uh, Or that they borrowed money from the mafia. Or that, that the scripts were literally written by high school students. They had a contest at a high school, Canadian, of course. Of course. To produce, you know, this... this the treatments, and this was part of the reason that the writer who portrays Ellison, or the character representing Ellison, quits the show. So, like these, those, you know, he, he gives some of the ideas to uh, the the technical consultant who's a stand-in for Bova, and you know, it's like those are terrible, and and the Ellison character goes, those are the best ones. Oh dear! And they list off a few of them, and I mean, they are absolutely. They're so bad and so cliched, and yet at the same time, I'm looking at that going, so did he really copy down their story idea? Or did he just make up a story idea that kind of seems like the sort of bad story ideas that they mm. came up with? And it, so I, I was kind of dissatisfied with the book because I came away from it. I'm like, I still am no closer to understanding the train wreck that was... And yet, obviously, some of it is real. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things he points out, and I have no doubt about this, and we were talking about our Canadian listeners, um, is that the Canadian television people had big chips on their shoulders. You know, we have television up here in Canada, too, you Yanks. <laughs> that kind of attitude. Apparently, that was quite prevalent. And... Let's go back to 1973. Yeah, they had television. But the state of their television production was oh, the it's same. Sad. It's the same level that we in the United States have at the local city level. Right. If, uh, if people want a comparison, think to you know, the classic Doctor Who that was on the BBC. That was better. Yes, much better. BBC was much, much better. See, the, the Canadian stuff was, you know, local station level stuff. They just weren't up to it at the time. They didn't have the facilities. They didn't have the, the know-how. They didn't have the writers, the staff. It just wasn't equipped up. And, of course, they were doing this for tax reasons and strike reasons and, and all sorts of bad reasons for going to Canada. And 
this really worked against, and of course it was cheap, um, it really worked against the show. So, I mean, that, that's, that's there. I, I'm not picking on the Canadians per se. I think that that's a fair assessment of the state of the Canadian thing. And I, you know, I can believe the whole, uh, the, the chip on the shoulder attitude because I've, I've known a few Canadians and they're great people until you get somebody says something like, you know, yeah, I just got back to America. And then they get all like, you know, you should be saying you got back to the United States because Canada is in America too. And so is Mexico. Splitting hairs. Uh-huh. And it's, it's, it's like, ooh, that obviously burns some of you, doesn't it? That, that people kind of think of Canada and Mexico as the sort of also rands of North America. And I, <clears throat> I don't think it's a fair assessment of Canada, but I, I think that there's um, that sentiment may, uh, may exist mm -hmm. at some point. So yeah, so anyway, Ben Bova Starcrossed, it's available in um in a new newish well, an anthology which I can't think of the name of right now. Uh but you can get on Amazon. Uh so I'm still hunting for what really went wrong on this show, but I I think we're I think it's just a, a perfect storm of bad. Yes, that's I think you that's exactly right. But it just it look it sound it sounded so good. On paper, it looks so good. It looks every bit as good as what we got out of Babylon 5, which, of course, we know you know, Harlan Ellison had a little bit to do with. Um, not a he lot. Just, he just whispered a little bit here, here and, there and there into Joe Straczynski's ear. It and feels, that was about it. It almost, you look at this and it almost feels like the grains were put there Yeah. Uh, all those years before. It's like, you know, this is what we ought to try on TV. And it failed, and so somebody else picked up the torch and said, "This is what we ought to try on TV," and it and it and it succeeded then. So, I think that's it. Got anything else? Uh, I I have nothing else on this show. So I guess we'll uh, we'll get on with Doctor Who after this one, and uh, then uh, we will be back to um, we'll be out of Doctor Who season. So we'll be until into, Christmas. Um, yeah, it's going to be, um, must be time for UFO again. Uh, I hate to say this, but I think it's time for Man from Atlantis. Don't we, don't we try to go British American, British American? So this is we American. Tossed that, we, we tossed that sorry, formula out. Yeah. Um, sorry, I, I meant United States. Doomwatch. <clears throat> oh, we could be up on Doomwatch. We haven't done Doomwatch. We've only done two episodes of Doomwatch so far. We could be on Doomwatch. Yeah. Poor well, can't your... Can't your okay, well, it. shoo! That's a relief. Oh. <laughs> UFO's not bad. I like UFO. No, UFO's... No, I was you thinking... You were worried about it, Man from Atlantis. I was worried that life was going to be Man from Atlantis, and I thought, oh, God, no. And and UFO, many of the episodes I've seen already, Doomwatch is very new to me, so I I find... I take great pleasure in watching those. So uh, then we'll probably then be talking to you more about the doom of the world um, when we see you again on another time on Fusion Patrol. Cheers. You've been listening to the Fusion Patrol podcast, a production of Lone Locust Productions. Join us on our new discussion forums at FusionPatrol.com. Find us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter Username, Fusion Patrol. You can also send us feedback by email at feedback at fusionpatrol.com. If you'd like to support Fusion Patrol, please leave us a review on iTunes. Fusion Patrol's theme music is Fight the Future by Amberwolf. <laughs>